Okay, so now we have the next talk by uh, Leo Zhao. Um, he will speak about the QAOA QA again um, at constant depth. Uh, welcome. Thank you, Martin, for the introduction and apologize for the technical difficulty. Uh, yeah, so today I will talk about this work where we study the QAOA uh, 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 on large sparse hypergraphs and spin glass models. And this is joint work with Joel Basso, uh, David Gamarnik, and, and Song Mei. So uh, this work is concerned with the task of solving combinatorial optimization problem, uh, which are defined as follows. So uh, you're given a cost function C over n bit strings. And the goal is to find some bit string Z star such that the cost is maximized. Uh, for example, uh, a, a very commonly discussed combinatorial optimization problem is the max cut problem, where you're given a graph, and you want to find a bipartition of vertices so that the a number of edges between them is uh, maximized. Uh, and the cost function can be written as a sum over edges, where each uh, term contributes 0 if the two bits uh, uh, if they agree, and, and 1 if they disagree. Uh, another example is the Sherrington Kirkpatrick spin glass problem. So here, the, uh, you're trying to maximize the energy of an OTR coupled spin system uh, with random sign couplings. Uh, where the couplings can be chosen, for example, from the standard normal distribution or, or uniformly from plus or minus one. And uh, there are many you know, optimization problems uh, that we encounter in real world applications. And of course, a big open question in the field is, uh, is there any possible uh, or convincing quantum advantage for solving them? So to this end, we want to study uh, uh, the QAOA, which is, uh, stands for quantum approximate optimization problem. Uh, just to briefly review, the, the idea is to assign a qubit to each bit, bit variable and initialize them in the plus state. You then apply an uh, uh, alternating sequence of unitary. The first is the evolution under the cost function, and the second is the global uh, X rotation. And you then you measure in the computational basis, and hopefully you get a bit string that has a good uh, cost function value. And, uh, but you do, do this uh, uh, unitary with uh, some parameters gamma and beta, and the idea is that if you choose this gamma and beta uh, cleverly, you can uh, potentially maximize the cost that you get when, uh, when you look at the measurement. And, and, and this algorithm is pr parameterized by uh, uh, integer p, which is uh, what sometimes people call the level of the algorithm, and it, it's basically the number of layers of these alternating unitaries that you, you apply. Now, this algorithm is attractive for a uh, few reasons. Uh, uh, first of all, it's one of the simplest algorithms you can uh, write down. Uh, and for that reason, it's very NISC-friendly for implementation. And in fact, it has already been tested in many experiments, such as uh, superconducting qubits and, and code atoms. And secondly, uh, this algorithm is, uh, is very quantum. Uh, in, this, in the sense that uh, uh, you cannot actually classically sample from this output distribution, uh, even at the lowest level, p equals 1, uh, assuming some reasonable uh, complexity theory conjectures, uh, which is sort of similar in flavor to this recent quantum supremacy experiments. And finally, an important property uh, of this algorithm is that uh, you're guaranteed to, to be able to find the maximum uh, 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 value of the cost function as a depth of the uh, as a level of, uh, p goes to infinity, uh, and and the idea there is basically you, you prove this by a reduction to the adiabatic uh, algorithm, but that uh, reduction you know could not naively require your depth to potentially scale exponentially in the system size, uh, but 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 generally you know this could take much fewer number of layers. Now this talk uh, will be about some rigorous uh, results on the analysis of average case performance of the QAOA at any constant level. So we'll consider uh, actually very general ensembles of uh, CLPs. Uh, so here you can think of a cost function as written as sum over um, you know, uh, up to Q-body couplings, uh, where uh, maybe you, you have some constant cutoff, Q max, and, and you, for each for each basically groups of, uh, of Q, Q bits, you have some assigned coupling J, as well as maybe a coefficient that kind of uh, weighs the different uh, Q body couplings differently. So an example uh, is the so-called mixed spin model. So there, uh, you, it's, it's defined for any sequence of coefficients uh, C, 
and you also uh, choose the J's to be randomly ch chosen from the, uh, the standard Gaussian distribution uh, with the variance normalized so that the maximum cost uh, scales extensively uh, linearly with the, with the system size. You can also consider uh, a, a special case of the mixed spin model, the so-called pure Q-spin model, where you basically only restrict yourself to the uh, 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 specific Q-body couplings. Uh, you can also consider uh, uh, a problem on sparse graphs, such as uh, max QZOR. So this is a, a generalization of max cut. You can define this on hypergraphs. And, and for that case, the cost function essentially uh, assigns a non-zero value uh, uh, to every possible uh, uh, Q tuple of, of couplings uh, uh, with, uh, with some probability d over to do the n uh, to the Q minus one power. And this is chosen so that the, uh, on average, uh, each, each bit is uh, supposed to interact exactly uh, in, in uh, d hyper edges. Uh, so this is sort of, uh, you can kind of think of this as a sparse uh, uh, version of graph, but in, but in the hyper graph generalization. So these are some you know, examples of ensembles that we will consider. But in particular, I would like to tell you about uh, the second one, uh, because there are some very interesting properties uh, of this uh, pure uh, Q-spin model. So it turns out that uh, there is something called a statistical computational gap in these uh, Q-spin uh, glasses. Uh, uh, when you choose these J couplings from this uh, normal uh, Gaussian distribution with mean zero, you can actually predict uh, from some deep results in statistical theory that the ground state energy is known with high probability. Uh, 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 you can basically compute this ground state energy uh, with some formula that you can evaluate uh, to, say, 15 decimals. Uh, for example, if you look at the two-spin model, uh, which is the same as the, the sherrington kirkpatrick model that I uh, discussed before, uh, it was known since the 80s and that uh, the, energy, uh, uh, dense, uh, the energy density of the ground state goes, converges to sort of this 1.07928 value. Uh, and also later, it was generalized to higher spin models. Uh, so for example, if you look at the three spin model, uh, the ground state energy is known also with higher probability to converge to 1.15 uh, in the large end limit. So even though this uh, spin glass models, uh, we know the ground state energy from uh, statistics, it, it turns out that uh, to find actually a bit string that achieves that energy uh, is actually very hard. Uh, it's actually, uh, currently there is no efficient algorithm known to find a near optimizer whenever a Q is greater than or equal to three. Uh, for example, if you look at the, uh, the three spin model uh, in particular, the best known algorithm for this is something called the approximate message passing, and it uh, achieves a value that's uh, 1.13, which is strictly worse than 1.15. Uh, and it turns out that this, this number is just not some arbitrary number. It, there's actually, this number is actually, uh, you can show it's a provable uh, uh, barrier for many algorithms uh, due to the presence of something called the overlap gap property in these spin glass problems. And that's also sort of re alluded to by Tony in his earlier talk. Uh, it's basically something to do with the, the, the solution space geometry when you look at uh, near ground states. So this is, presents a very interesting opportunity for quantum algorithms because uh, you know we, you have a situation where you know exactly what the the, the energy of the, the state you're looking for, uh, and you can basically try as hard as you can with the algorithm that finds. And you can also verify how well you're doing by by comparing it to this, this, this a statistical prediction. And there's also no hardness result for classical. Uh, for classical algorithm. And this, this, these problems are not also not NP-hard, so maybe you know, if you don't believe that quantum computers can solve NP-hard problems, maybe this is an a intermediate hardness problem that's worth tackling. So the question we want to address in this work is uh, how well does the QAOA perform on this problem? So our first uh, main result is that we are actually able to give a rigorous formula for the, for the average case performance of the QAOA on these problems. Uh, in fact, we actually consider more general ensembles, like I mentioned before. So for any ensemble where you have the coupling J drawn from some mean zero symmetric distribution, uh, and there's also some mild assumptions that we, we have to assume, but they're not very restrictive, then if you give me any fixed uh, uh, level P and any set of parameters gamma and beta, there's actually an explicit formula that I can, I can give you that tells you what the expected energy of the uh, output of the QAOA uh, is uh, with respect to this uh, ensemble of, uh, of, of uh, CLPs. And furthermore, you can also consider evaluating the second moment of this, uh, of this uh, expectation of cost function in the quantum state. And it turns out that it's equal exactly to the expectation uh, squared. 
So that actually gives a very interesting corollary, is that, uh, which is the, that the measurement uh, outcomes of, a, of the QAOA applied to a typical instance run from these random ensembles concentrate at the, the, the expected value. So this is actually a, a very strong concentration uh, result in the sense that we have two types of concentration. One is the concentration of the measurement. So this is sort of similar to what uh, Tony was talking in his earlier, uh, uh, earlier uh, talk, uh, where basically if you take a, uh, take a random instance and you measure the output uh, and look at the distribution of uh, the, the cost function, it concentrates at the average uh, with respect to that particular instance. But also what we have is concentration over instances. So not only is the, the bit string uh, for each uh, specific instance concentrated at, at the average, also for this ensemble of, of, uh, of, of problems, uh, if you look at rent different problems, say, and if you evaluate the cost function expectation at a given fixed parameters, uh, they look the same. Basically, the landscape of of the QAOA cost function and the function of the parameters are, are also essentially the same for different instances in the, in the large system size. So the first uh, type of concentration was uh, already discussed, but this new type of, con this uh, second type of concentration, as far as we know, is only showing in, in, uh, in our work. And I would also like to just briefly compare uh, this, this result to some previous uh, work, which uh, has also done, this has been actually quite a lot of work that has done rigorous analysis of the QAOA in the past few years. So, uh, so uh, starting with uh, the work uh, by myself and Farhi Goldstone and Gottman in 2019, we were able to uh, analyze the QAOA applied to, uh, any, uh, to any level, constant level P for two-body problems. And later, this was generalized uh, to sparse graphs uh, uh, for any level p at two, uh, in two-body systems, uh, as well as uh, general q-body problems, uh, q-body coupling problems, uh, but only at p equals one. Uh, but in this work, we were able to, you know, take those uh, analysis, which were limited uh, to their special cases, to basically any kind of q-body couplings and, and any constant level p. Now, given that we have this nice formalism to compute basically the expected uh, energy of, uh, of basically many, ge many general ensembles of CLPs, uh, we also uh, uh, discovered a second uh, result, which is that uh, the, the performance of the QAOA exhibits sort of a universality type uh, property. Uh, and here, what I mean by that is that if you look at random, say, uh, dense spin, uh, Q spin models uh, with Gauss, Gaussian couplings, uh, uh, and, you, and you can also look at uh, uh, the QAOA on sparse problems, uh, like Max Huzor, uh, it turns out that uh, you can kind of think of them as basically instances where the Js are drawn from different random distributions. Uh, but it turns out that uh, you know, in, in some asymptotic limit, uh, as long as the first and second moment agrees between these random distributions, uh, uh, the, the, the QAOA's uh, performance on these problems actually uh, also agree asymptotically. So basically, it's, uh, in the large, in, in some, for example, in the large degree limit, uh, if you apply the QAOA to sparse graphs, it converges to the, to the same kind of value of energy you will get if you apply it to, to dense graphs. Uh, and I will just give a few remarks here. I, uh, so there's actually previous uh, sort of universality type results that were known for the ground state energies of these, uh, these problems. Uh, by that I mean that if you look at uh, just the, the actual problem themselves, like the QSP model, as well as Max QSOR on, on sparse hypergraphs, uh, it is also known that the ground state between these two families of problems also converge in, in, the, uh, in the large degree uh, asymptotic limit. But uh, these Classical results uh, were established using something called uh, Lindenberg uh, type argument, which was basically what was uh, a, a one way of proving the central limit theorem. Uh, and we tried to actually apply those type of uh, arguments to prove this uh, universality, but it turns out that it seems to, uh, this kind of argument doesn't quite work in the quantum setting. Uh, and instead, uh, this theorem was proven by actually using the formula that I described in the previous uh, result in theorem one and show by explicit computation that the formula applied to the different ensembles agree uh, by basically algebraically e e uh, equating them. So it's sort of a very interesting kind of way of proving sort of this uh, universality result that's different from uh, previous classical results. 
And uh, we can also, you know, take these formulas that we have for the performance of the QAOA and evaluate them uh, uh, at different levels of P. Uh, currently, the cost of evaluating this scales, unfortunately, uh, exponentially with the, with the level, number of levels on a classical computer. But we do see that, for example, if you look at the Q equals 2 curve, uh, uh, if you look at the uh, approximation ratio, which is probably on the y-axis versus 1 over the level, uh, so, so you should kind of go from right to left here if you want to go to large depth. It does seem to kind of converge to 1 uh, if you follow with your eye uh, for, the blue, for the blue curve at Q equals 2. But for the harder problems that was known to be hard for classical algorithms, like uh, Q equals 3, 4, 5, and 6, uh, it's unclear how well uh, this, the algorithm will do here, uh, whether or not it will actually converge to approximation ratio 1. And it turns out that uh, for at least some subclass of these problems, uh, uh, we can actually have a provable result that shows uh, a, a negative, uh, which is uh, there actually exists uh, some number that's strictly worse than the optimum value, such that uh, for any fixed level P and parameters uh, gamma beta, the QAOA performs stri uh, strictly worse than this, this uh, threshold, uh, which is set by the overlap gap property. So uh, comparing this to previous results, uh, well, I mean, actually it was known before that there are some limitations of the QAOA, uh, uh, but most of them, uh, uh, minus the result that was presented by Tony, all uses the, the fact that the uh, QAOA has sort of a locality property when you apply it to sparse graphs. So, so this only makes sense uh, when, uh, in a regime where the algorithm doesn't see the whole graph. Uh, for example, uh, this is uh, used in this two paper uh, by Farhi Goldstone and Gamarnik and, and uh, some, some, some people from, I, I believe, Harvard, I don't remember all the names, uh, but, but there they basically exploit the locality of the algorithm, uh, which can kind of gives you a marginal independence between different neighborhoods of the graph and, and allows you to kind of construct a resampling uh, 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 procedure to kind of uh, construct uh, bit strings that, that are basically, uh, has a forbi uh, overlap structure that's forbidden by OGP. That's how you establish a type of contradiction to prove sort of uh, hardness of approximation. But once you have a dense graph, like an RTL connected q spin model, uh, these arguments don't apply because your light cone is entire, the entire graph, even at, at the lowest level of p equals 1. But our proof actually you know, uses this previous result uh, and, and an idea that we call dense from sparse reduction. And it's actually very simple. The proof of this is like two lines. Uh, basically, you know, the, the result from this previous uh, paper that I mentioned implies that for, for, uh, for sparse graphs, for sparse hypergraphs, uh, the QAOA is uh, limited because of this locality. So there's some threshold uh, set by the overlap gap property, which is strictly worse than the optimum value that, uh, that you cannot surpass uh, at these constant levels. And then we have this universality result that I mentioned in, in theorem two, which tells you that the, the performance on the sparse graph is related to the, the performance on the dense graphs. So by this equality, we, we can then show that the performance on the dense graph is also limited. So we have uh, the punchline is that we have hardness uh, from this overlap gap property even when the whole graph is seen. So in the remainder of my talk, I would just kind of briefly give you a sense of the, uh, the technical challenge that was uh, resolved by this paper. So the, the starting point is that if you want to compute an observable uh, expectation in a quantum circuit state, you can kind of write it down as a sum over path. Uh, and we used sort of an idea that was sort of started by this uh, 2019 paper uh, with Farhi, Goldstone, and Gottman, that you can kind of write this sum over path to sort of a more uh, compact basis that we call the configuration basis, which counts the number of paths of different types uh, that you have between the n different bits. So you can have a kind of representation that doesn't, you know, uh, that's not just a sum over exponential number of, of, of bit strings. Uh, but now if you look at this sum, uh, this sum is basically, you know, you have n choose uh, a bunch of uh, positive, non-negative integers, integers m's that counts the number of possible different type of, types of path. And this is sort of a kind of a multinomial sum. And the issue uh, of actually evaluating this is that if you have a, a, a exponential of a polynomial where the degree of the polynomial is larger than one, uh, if you want to evaluate this explicitly with a multinomial theorem, it, it doesn't quite work whenever you have a degree two or higher polynomial in the, in the exponential. Uh, 
And you can also try to maybe, you know, think of this as, okay, maybe we can approximate this multinomial sum by kind of thinking of the, uh, the m's as some kind of multinomially distributed variables. Uh, but, then, uh, but then the issue is that this, the, this q numbers are actually complex numbers. Uh, so it's, that interpretation no longer really holds. Uh, another approach you can maybe try is that, okay, why, what if we just kind of, you know, take the continuum limit in some sense and we kind of write this down as some kind of path integral. Uh, and then you can try to do a saddle point approximation to this path integral. But this is, you know, highly non-rigorous. Uh, and, and I mean, in general, actually, is a, is a calculation tool that's used widely in physics, but in most cases, is, is very non-rigorous. You do get an answer, but it's not clear if it's, uh, you know, provably correct. Uh, and we sort of tackle this challenge by proving something called a, a generalized multinomial theorem, which is basically a method to evaluate this type of um, uh, generalized multinomial sums. Uh, this is sort of, you know, the uh, kind of give you an idea of the, the for, uh, sort of uh, the statement of the, the, the theorem. But, but it turns out that, you know, this theorem has a very nice interpretation in the sense that it's actually surprisingly consistent with the saddle point approximation of the path integral. What I, what I mean is that if you just kind of, you know, write this uh, sum as a path integral in the continuum limit and then just take the saddle point approximation, and by that I mean if you look at the this sort of this, uh, this term in the exponential, you kind of think of it as the action, and you look at the saddle point of this action, and you, then you just basically plug it into the, uh, the, the function downstairs, and that actually gives you the same result as uh, the, the sort of this provable, uh, correct result that we get from this generalized polynomial theorem. So there's sort of a nice interpretation of how this calculation can be done. Okay, so uh, now I just summarize. Um, uh, uh, so I've given you uh, a, a way to, sh uh, to derive an analytical formula for expected values uh, 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 of the energy achieved by the QAOA in the limit, infinite size limit at any parameters for many sort of uh, new ensembles of uh, co uh, combinatorial optimization problems. We're also able to prove concentration uh, of QAOA over both instances and, and measurements. Uh, and we also show sort of a universality uh, a property of the QAOA performance, which uh, shows that basically for many ensembles of, uh, of combinatorial uh, optimization problem, uh, the, the outcome, the, the sort of the energy uh, output by the, the, the algorithm doesn't really depend very sensitively on the, the, the underlying distribution other than the first and second moment. So basically, in particular, you can show that the sparse and dense uh, graphs have a sort of a very similar performance in the, in the asymptotic limit. And then we show using this universality result a limitation of the QAOA for dense graphs uh, using this dense from sparse uh, reduction. Uh, and some open questions that I will leave you with is, uh, can we tighten this concentration bound? So, so uh, currently we only have sort of this uh, uh, argument from showing that the second moment agrees with the first moment square, so it doesn't give you a very tight bound. Uh, uh, and uh, Tony, Tony's work with Anirak has shown actually kind of an exponential concentration over measurements uh, for a fixed instance, but they don't have an improved concentration bound for instances, so that will be very nice to get if we can. Uh, and can we also develop more general purpose methods, uh, such as the Lindenberg method in, in, in classical statistics, uh, to prove universality in, in quantum setting? I think, personally, that's a very interesting technical uh, question. Uh, and, and also, it's still very interesting, even though we have shown that uh, the constant level uh, QAOA is not able to find the, the optimum uh, for these spin glass problems, but how does it compare to the best classical algorithm? I, that is still kind of open, uh, uh, because currently the, all we know is that both algorithms don't get to the optimum. Uh, and in particular, you know, can we get a better understanding uh, of the large P asymptotics beyond our current formula, which kind of requires uh, exponential in P complexity to evaluate? And furthermore, can we somehow uh, use this sort of dense from sparse reduction re to kind of maybe uh, apply to more sophisticated version of overlap gap property to more tightly upper bound the performance of this QAOA. And finally, all of the results that we've mentioned so far, in, uh, including the one that's uh, presented in the earlier talk, uh, only applies when p is sufficiently small. So for example, if p is greater than two times log n, uh, none of the results that we've discussed apply. So, 
So really, and, and, and we know that when P is allowed to grow uh, exponentially with M, uh, for ex example, you're able to get to the optimum for these, for these problems. But the question still remains, how fast does P actually need to go, grow? I mean, is exponential really necessary? Or, you know, if, it, if we can somehow show that a polynomial growth is sufficient to achieve near optimality for this spin glass problem, that, then we will have a really convincing case for uh, quantum advantage. That's all. I'll take more questions. Thank you. So, other questions? Uh, yeah, Richard. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, hopeful question. Can you use your generalized uh, multinomial theorem to maybe make other physics e path integral calculations rigorous, or is this a happy coincidence? That is something that we are actively exploring. I mean, it's currently it's unclear uh, how well you can. Uh, I mean, there's. I mean, there's a lot of different places where it is used. I mean, certainly we cannot deal with infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces currently, but uh, but uh, but we are hoping to, for example, look at is is it a way is it possible to look at Grover's algorithm and, and recover something similar from this uh, different way of looking at it. Uh, but I think so far it it doesn't seem easy. Uh, I think that it's not clear that the same large end. I mean, here the the. The trick is that you can take, the, there's a parameter to the saddle point approximation, and in this case is n. Uh, but when you have these things that kind of scales differently with n in your problem, uh, then I think it becomes trickier. Like, what's the right way of like taking the limit? So, so it's unclear. But I think certainly this, this I, I believe that this type of, uh, uh, this theorem could apply to so at least some more general version of QAOA, for example. Yeah. OK, that would be. Time for maybe one more question, if there's one. Yeah, if not, then let's uh, thank Leo again.